The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at, the, and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up from David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Our gospel lesson for today is Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. And since this is a longer story from scripture, I will be reading the first portion and Pastor Christie will finish with the latter. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as a priest before God and, and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now, at the time of incense offering, the whole assembly of people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, and he was terrified Standing at the right side of the altar, when Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know that this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did not come out, when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service had ended, he went home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. The message, do not be afraid, in some form or fashion, is repeated 365 times in the Bible, 365. Now in divinity school, we're taught that numbers in the Bible are symbolic. They usually have some kind of complex veiled meaning, but this one, it's not really all that mysterious. The message that we need to hear, do not be afraid every single day. Do not fear, I am with you. Fear not, I have redeemed you. Perfect love casts out fear over and over and over. Imagine if we could hear God whispering that in our ear every morning or every night, every single day of the year. 
Now, not all fear is bad. A healthy dose of fear is a good thing. There's a book uh, called The Gift of Fear, in which the author goes into great detail how healthy fear can protect us in important ways. The author says, true, true fear is a gift. Unwarranted fear is a curse. Learn how to tell the difference. And it goes on and on to give good examples of how sometimes our gut instincts can protect us. When a date won't take no for an answer, a stranger in a deserted parking lot offers unsolicited help. This book was written years ago, way before the pandemic, but we've seen how healthy fear motivates us to change our habits and wear masks and get vaccines and all of that is a good use of healthy fear. And then there's also a, a healthy fear that um, is, it's a spiritual experience. And that often it's called the fear of God. You might consider it also a profound awe of God's holiness. The recognition that we are not God and God is God holy. Zechariah's fear and the sight and the words of the angel probably was a mix of that gut instinct and the deeply ingrained practices of his, his spiritual practice. Jews in ancient Israel were taught over and over to fear God, to be in reverent awe of God because God's presence was so powerful. Remember that this is the time when you couldn't see the face of God and live. That God's presence was so powerful, it had to be veiled, but yet stays with us. Like in the, um, with, with the Israelites in the cloud of fire by night, in the cloud uh, of cloud by day, in the pillars of fire and cloud, veiled, not seen face to face. As a priest, I imagine that Zechariah had a very well-developed sense of this holy fear, this awe of God, as he was one of the few that could enter the sanctuary. It was no coincidence that Zechariah offered the prayers in the sanctuary on that day. He was chosen by lot. It was a high holy honor but when he was chosen, there could have been as many as a couple thousand priests. It could be that you were only chosen by lot once in your lifetime. And this was Zechariah's day. It was likely that this was his one time. So there he was with the whole assembly of people praying outside, and he was the one to offer the incense on their behalf. Now, I know that many of you have very fervent prayers, but these prayers were not just like the prayers that we offer. These were prayers for their very forgiveness of sin. Imagine that Zechariah, for us, was offering all of our confessions to God and asking God to forgive us. Pulling back the curtain, stepping into the sacred sanctuary while we all wait in anticipation, might we be forgiven? The smell of the incense was drifting through the crowd, I'm sure stronger for those in the front, but still wafting all the way to the back. The people were kneeling, asking, begging for God's mercy. All of this is Zechariah's backdrop. I can only relate to an extent. I've heard it said that this stole that pastors wear can be a heavy weight. And I have felt that at times, certainly carrying the needs of your people, of holding their hands as they approach death, people's fears and questions. And although some pastors do hear confession, it happens usually more informally in the Methodist tradition. People come and they're seeking the removal of guilt from their lives, guilt and shame when 
you come to me for that. I, I can't ever imagine the weight that Zechariah felt because I get to say, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. I've thought often about the privilege of the Jewish priest to enter the sanctuary, but today I'm considering the weight that must have been on Zechariah's shoulders. The very real fear, not, not terrible fear, but profound, sacred fear. So there he is on behalf of all the people interceding for them and making their offering. And then the angel of the Lord appears. Gabriel, it says, standing in the presence of the Lord was sent to Zechariah in the sanctuary with a message. Now for me, that would be when I passed out. (laughs) Why wouldn't Zechariah be terrified? Why wouldn't he be overwhelmed by fear? You can't see the face of God and live. This is the closest thing. Now, while God often speaks to individuals, both in the biblical story and in our uh, current reality, and there are countless stories, and some of you have had experiences of God speaking to you in a very personal way, But when we focus on those very personal experiences with God, Scripture focuses more on the communal aspect of God's speaking, even if it is into an individual. There's a communal aspect. There's a global impact of God's interaction with individuals. So it wouldn't make sense, really, in from the biblical perspective, for God to only answer a personal prayer for Zechariah. Not, not at this moment, because he's there on behalf of all the people. Why would it only be for Zechariah and Elizabeth? It wasn't. It was for all the people. This message this message of hope, this message of the preparation for the promised coming. It was for the people, not just Zechariah and Elizabeth. The angel says, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. It begins with the personal. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness. And here's where it becomes communal. And many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink even before his birth. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God with the spirit and power of Elijah. Even John is in a whole line of prophets connected communally. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him, before the very Savior himself, to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and make ready a people. Make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John the baptizer, the one who will prepare people for the Lord, the one and only thing that can conquer that kind of fear that keeps us bound, that keeps us locked away with the generosity of our hearts, that keeps us in a state of self-protection all the time that keeps us from loving our neighbor. The only thing that can release us, freedom for the prisoner, release for the captive, Jesus. This is the message of the coming of Messiah, the one who will release us from our unholy fears. Spiritual author Max Licato talks about the kind of fear that binds us 
the kind of fear that keeps us from loving our neighbor. He says, fear, it seems, has taken a hundred year lease on the building next door and set up shop. Oversized and rude, fear is unwilling to share the heart with happiness. Happiness complies and leaves. Do you ever see the two together? Fear is the big bully in the high school hallways, brash, loud, and unproductive. For all the noise that fear makes and the room it takes, fear does little good. Fear never wrote a symphony or sang a spiritual, negotiated peace in broken relationships, or granted new life through healing and forgiveness. Courage did that. Faith did that. God did that. Breaking through the fear. People who refused to bow to fear help make these things come to be. But fear itself, fear herds us into a prison and slams the doors. Wouldn't it be great to walk out? Wouldn't it be great to walk out? With the message to Zechariah, God is opening the doors, preparing to fling the curtain of the sanctuary and the doors of all of our prisons wide open. The coming of the Savior is not only unlocking but dismantling the doors of fear and sin that keep us imprisoned. But God knows us well, and God knows that we need to be prepared. In the same way that your eyes need a minute to adjust to the light after you have been in complete darkness, so our spirits need preparation to go from fear to freedom. We stay even behind unlocked doors sometimes, much less locked ones. Sometimes it's simply too hard to believe that we could actually walk out of the unlocked doors of our prisons, our prisons of fear, of shame, and guilt, of so many things that bind us, even though Christ has opened all the doors. As Zechariah is inside the sanctuary, all the people waiting, they're praying for forgiveness. God is already moving among them. God is beginning to lift the veil, to crack open the curtain of the sanctuary, of the holy coming to be among us. By the coming of John the Baptist who preaches repentance and forgiveness of sins, who will prepare them for the flinging open of the curtain of the entrance to the sanctuary itself in the coming of Christ, who, who is himself the very temple of God, the temple of grace and forgiveness. Today is the Sunday of hope. What greater hope can we have than the coming of a Savior? We don't have to offer burnt sacrifices offerings or incense we don't have to have someone intercede for us with God on our behalf we have direct access to God's infinite power love grace and mercy the prison doors are unlocked open and God has just shoved them to the ground and they are just waiting for us to walk right over them (laughs) 